This is the after party. Your hosts are the Great Order and No White Guilt. The crown winner of last week is Rum Rum for gifting a total of 10 Prometheus Rising dollars stupendous accolades and gratitude to you dear lady thank you so very much in second place was our very own making waves for white well-being across the stratosphere tall kevin gifting four dollars thank you so very much as well dear brother now as you all know you can financially gift on entropy at 15 percent as soon as i have it up and running and you can also watch the stream there. We would like you to do that over on theafterparty.tv. You can also vote, uh, ask and vote on questions. And those questions won't disappear until you or I delete them. Uh, you can also participate in polls if I decide to put any up. Cash App is also an alternative for financial gifting at only 6%. And of course, as you all know, Jared and I evenly share the financial gifts with our guests here on the after party. Now today, we have the man with a golden mic and a honeyed voice on tap, the one and the only James Edwards. Now James, please introduce yourself to those who may have been living under a rock and don't know who you are. Tell them where they can find you and the kind of work that you do. And then Mr. George will take us into the conversation. Well, thank you guys, uh, Jason and Jared. It's always great to be on with the two most prolific content creators in our whole sphere. Uh, every time I'm on Twitter and it says, see what's live, and I'll push the little button to take me up to the top to see what's live, it's always y'all, every time. <laughs> it could be midnight, it could be noon, it's 3 a.m., 3 p.m. Y'all are always out there doing something, and it's always good, and it's always good work. So it's great to be back. It's been a while. Uh, I know we talk behind the scenes, and sometimes you're on with us, Jason, but it's been a while since I've been uh, here at TAP, you know, for the matinee edition. Yeah. So um, th this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to today. So for my work, uh, thepoliticalcesspool.org, we've been on the radio for uh, now in our 16th year. It'll be 16 full years. Uh, about two months, exactly two months from now, October 26th, we'll make 16 full years. So wow. decade and a half anyway. What a glorious triumph that is. Nicole. Well, it's been a year of reflection. I mean, there obviously hasn't been much in the news this year. It's been a pretty calm <laughs> year. So, <laughs> yeah, we're, been, uh, as I said on Twitter, we're just going to talk about um, kittens and butterflies today. It's going to be a light kind of a show. Uh -huh. yeah, what else is there to talk about, guys? I mean, but no, yeah, for yeah. me, it has been a year of reflection. So, it was actually 20 years ago this month. In August of 2000, I was out in Long Beach, California as a delegate for Pat Buchanan at the Reform yeah. Party Convention. And I know third party activism is sort of uh, resuscitated as a, or been revived as, uh, as something our people are looking into and thinking about. And so, you know, that's where I cut my teeth back in 99 and 2000 with Pat working on that campaign and as a teenager. And then, you know, I turned 20 in, in uh, the summer of 2000. So that was 20 years ago. And then 18 years ago, I, I launched my own bid for, for public office. I ran for a seat in the Tennessee State Legislature as an independent. Uh, and that was just a wonderful experience. I mean, it didn't end the way that uh, I thought that it might because we really did run to win. Uh, but that was 18 years ago at a campaign headquarters, a lot of great volunteers. I mean, we ran that as a really professional bid for to, to win. I mean, it wasn't, uh, you know, a platform to get out ideas or anything like that. We ran for one mission that was to win and it fell short, but it did open the, the road for me to get into radio, which uh, was now 16 years ago, as we just mentioned. And so, you know, we always look for the, the doors. The doors will be opened. You seek an open door and then you go in it. Um, and, and so that's the way I've always tried to do it. So 16 years now on the radio, though. God. It's been wonderful. Met a lot of great people, obviously. Well, you actually helped us celebrate our two-year anniversary it's not quite yeah. 16 but that's the last time you were on in february when we did our two-year anniversary oh, show. Now, yeah. Yeah. and anyone who is interested yeah. in hearing james's uh, full story a little bit more of those interesting details about how the work for buchanan blossomed into his own political campaign like he said and that 11 radio and what it's like dealing 
being a public figure all these years dealing with communications, we go into that in depth the first time he appeared on tap. If memory serves, that was in December of 2018. And again, that is always archived and cataloged now safely on our shared site and on also on me and Jason's individual sites. So we try to make it theirs because we want this work to live and go beyond uh, the limits of social media. But as mentioned, yeah, it's um, a bit of a light year. We don't really know what to talk about. Um, James is a family man as well. And so we will have some light at the end of the tunnel. I'll, I'll plant that now so that you know there's going to be some uh, something more positive and beautiful to talk about at the end. But there's still what I like about you, James, and we all agree with you here is that you can look at the challenges of the world and still have a smile on your face. So first, in fact, on that yeah. first tap you appeared in December of 2018, you said you describe yourself as a happy warrior. And I've always loved that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's definitely a time where you really have to take stock and keep yourself centered amongst all this, but still face it head on and not be an ostrich about it either. There's always that balance. So we know you've been talking on your own show about all the stuff going on, COVID rule, the riots, the election, how all these things might even all tie together to some degree. So uh, we're just going to talk a little about uh, all of it, kind of give a survey of your feelings on the summer of 2020 and let our community kind of digest some of these goings on as well. Of course, Jason frames a lot of the news stories week to week on his Sunday going free streams as well. But this will just kind of be a way for us to bring it all together on this tap right now as we're in August right now, getting towards the end of the summer of 2020. So what, uh, what is your view and how did it all start for you? Uh, when did you know something was up in the, I guess we could start with maybe the riots and some of the civil unrest going on for the last few months. And then well, we'll from there. to a point you made a second ago, I think this is important for everyone, everyone tuning in tonight is to not let yourself fall into despair. Uh, or, or fall victim to, to worry. I mean, we have to obviously take a, a sober assessment of the world around us, and we have to, with, with open eyes and, and an open mind, understand these goings-on that do impact us, but at the same time, you can't let anything steal your joy. And so I've always tried to be very well-rooted in that. Um, and of course, this, this work uh, gives purpose to one's life. I mean, obviously, without challenges and without opponents, uh, what kind of life is there? I mean, we need to be engaged in serious work. Uh, we need to be able to rise to an occasion and apply ourselves to something that is greater than our existence on this very temporal plane. And so um, to the best of my ability, I've, uh, I've attempted to do that. And one of the things that does make me a happy warrior is, is that I know that uh, I have a flock to tend to. And when your life does have purpose, uh, you can you can face each day with with a little more vigor, and of course you know uh, that's not even counting my my wife and children, which which I guess we may touch on later. But yeah, with this year it started off, you know, we were looking forward, I guess, to, to the extent you can look forward to another election year. That whole bread and circus, and uh, of course, mm -hmm. four years ago, four years ago, I was at the Republican National Convention as a credentialed member of the media, so that was a unique experience, and obviously. Um, a lot of the hope that we had for candidate Trump hasn't really panned out to whether he's part of the reason why that hasn't worked out or if he's just been out maneuvered. You know, that's a, that's a whole nother debate and discussion. Uh, but we really, you know, obviously we haven't seen the wall. A lot of the things that we had hoped he would be able to do he either hasn't done or just hasn't been able to do. But uh, in any event, we it was an election year and that, that's always interesting, I guess. And I think the last memory I had of a normal year was around Valentine's Day. We had a ladies night on the program and we did a Valentine's Day show with a lot of our female friends. And then it was pretty much into March. And then you had the, the COVID hysteria, which is certainly not only dis not dissipated, it's only amplified and become more restrictive. Um, it was all COVID all the time until that incident in Minneapolis, which sparked off nationwide riots that, like this hurricane that a lot of our friends in Louisiana and in Texas are suffering through today, COVID and the riots have only picked up steam and more energy as we inch closer to the most unusual election in American history. I mean, it's almost as if they're not campaigning. I mean, Biden, for obvious reasons, can't campaign. And there just hasn't been a lot going on with that. I mean, the, the Zoom conventions, as we've seen in the last two weeks, but 
guys, I don't even know where you would start. And, and I'm happy. There, there's something surreal about yes. the convention. I know it, it's gonna. It does make it feel like we're in this uh, bizarro universe. Uh, we well, you start with COVID. You mentioned COVID, so maybe we'll just take it chronologically because COVID did hit. That news became more widespread, and I guess it was around March, more or less. I know there was different rollouts in different parts of the country, but it seems like March. Obviously, we heard murmurings about it from January coming from China, but March it seems like that's when the restrictions happened. Uh, what was it like in your area of the country, in the part of the South that you're in? Uh, not from what I know, not being quite as by big big cities and. Uh, what was kind of the pulse, the feel on the street there and how seriously people were taking things and the, these ideas that we had to shut down our way of life? Yeah. Yeah, well, it was, it, it, I can vividly remember it. I mean, obviously it was only a, a few months ago, but you, you just really saw a really slow boil progression. I can remember after a lot of the things started shutting down. I mean, nobody really paid attention to the stay at home orders. I never saw any decrease in traffic. I mean, obviously you couldn't go into restaurants and bars and some things were absolutely locked out, uh, but you still saw people on the streets. You could go into the stores and nobody was wearing a mask. I, I can remember seeing the first handful of people you would go into a grocery store and you might see just a, a scattering of people in masks. I was like, wow. They're really buying into this. I mean, you know, to me, it was never, I was never, my gut instinct has always been a good barometer. I always listen to my gut. Yeah. Uh, very rarely does it take me in the wrong direction. And I just didn't think, I mean, aside from the fact that the media lies about everything. Yes. I mean, so you got to take that into account to begin with. If the media is speaking with one voice on something, your default position to be should be to believe it. <laughs> but at the same time, when it's something that, that could potentially, if they made the mistake in telling the truth of, for, for a change, uh, impact your family. You want to err on the side of caution, I guess, to an extent. So let's let's do some due diligence. Let's look around. Let's take a, take a look into this. And uh, I personally don't believe the numbers. I don't believe this is the black death. I don't believe if you go outside without a mask and you can track this thing, you're dead. I know people who, who have tested positive for it and they either had no symptoms at all or it was relatively mild. I mean, this is personal firsthand testimony from people I trust. But no, I remember seeing the first handful of people wearing masks and thinking, wow, this is really unusual. And it was almost like a uh, like like seeing, you know, somebody, uh, you know, some animal outside of the zoo or something. Some you <laughs> see, you know, say something had gotten out. And it was a novelty, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it became more and more and more and more and more stores and chains and corporations required it for entry. Now it's gotten to the point where you can't engage in commerce yeah. unless you do it. I probably put a mask on 10 times, you know, yeah. from the whole t time it started. And, and, and uh, maybe nine out of those 10 have been in very recent where I have to go in. I had to get my driver's license renewed. I turned 40 in June. I could not go into the DMV with that one. I had to have a driver's license. I put it on. I had to go in there. They wouldn't do business with me if I didn't. So it's gotten to that point. And now, of course, every you should, have asked them, you should have asked them if you could have kept the mask on when they took the new picture. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could take it off. The, well, I mean, obviously, you have to wear it when you enter a restaurant. But if you move five feet further and sit down, I guess the virus can't spread. I mean, there's just so much to get <laughs> up. But it's it's really, I think to me, the, the, the biggest takeaway from COVID is that, again, personally, everybody do what you think is right and what is the right decision for your family. There's no shame if you feel as though you need to, to just go overboard and, and wear a mask. I mean, I don't judge people about that. But um, I... I don't think it's, it's it's very serious. I don't think it's a very serious disease. I think it does show the extent to which a consistent drumbeat of a message propagated by the entirety of, of the media yeah. can get people to do whatever they want them to yeah. do, no matter how unsensible it, it seems. I mean, it, it goes back to the old thing we like to say, who are you going to believe, the media or your lying eyes? Are you seeing people drop dead or do everybody you know have this? Everybody catching it. Do the mask even work? I mean, I remember, I, that's another thing I remember. I remember the Surgeon General, I believe, it said, quit using the mask. You know, we need them for the medical professionals. They don't help. And all of a sudden now it's just like, if you don't wear them, uh, you're, you're dead. It's almost like attempted murder. And people have taken this. <laughs> what is the book? I, I always have this book on the tip of my tongue. Whoever can, can pull it up. It was by, I believe, Charles McKay, Charles McKee, an 18th century, 19th century Scottish 
journalists. It's uh, uh, incredible popular delusions and the madness of crowds or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. It's out on the, uh, you know, you can get it anywhere now. It's, it's public use. And, but I mean, he talks about a lot of this, but it, it, mm. the, um, even then, and not much has changed. It's just a different time and a different circumstance and a different story. But the way people buy into delusions, I mean, you can go back to the witch trials or whatever, um, is, is really scary when it comes to assessing the, the maturity of, of, of humanity. But now it's almost taken like a religious-like zeal and a religious-like fervor. If you don't wear a mask, people are ready to fight you. They do, uh, yeah. That, that's really the extent to which, to which it's gotten. And it, it's led me to believe that, uh, and, and with no exaggeration, if the media decided to come out with a consistent message well, the sky is red. It's not blue. You thought it was blue this whole time, but it's actually red. Right. And they issue punishments for people who go on continuing to say it's blue against everything we may see and know to be true. Uh, I give it, I mean, if COVID's any example, six months, everybody be saying the sky is red with absolute <laughs> conviction and sincerity. And that's, that's, yeah. that's what we're dealing with here. Now, why, why? It has come to this, you know. That's a, that's that's a debate that I don't have an answer for. Why? Yeah, are they you took the question out of my mouth because obviously we have to be sensitive to the platforms we're on, and ultimately, uh, Jason runs the channel. So, Jason, I defer to you on uh, how we approach this. But I was going to ask you, James, what you thought is kind of behind that, because as you said, I think we're all in agreement where, especially if you have older or compromised members of your family, it is best to err on the side of caution. I mean, it's it is very hard to tell when. You know, they always say people died after being diagnosed with COVID, which is this little technicality. It's not the quite same thing as saying, well, we know that they died because of COVID. So the death might not quite be related. You know, maybe they just had a weak immune system and other things were going on. Uh, there's even question in our own circles about whether our friend Simon Harris over in Spain, if that had something to do with COVID, uh, who unfortunately died back in May. Um, my parents know someone who died after contracting COVID. So I do understand being careful when I go and visit my parents, I try to be careful before I go and see them. Um, but yeah, it does all lead to that, that next question of, well, if they are controlling people, I mean, at the very least, even if we can't, no one can really say why, you know, we can all just take educated guesses, but where you're going is something I think we're all interested in, which is how fear and everyone having this feeling of having to walk on eggshells that itself is a powerful lever mm -hmm. and how you can kind of dance around the game like we're saying be careful where you need to be to protect your family but not to let that mindset get into your own personal space that we we're talking about being the happy warrior before about not having it infiltrate your own emotions and mind and change the feel of your own life if that makes sense well, no, it does make sense. And you, you covered a lot in, in a short time. I mean, of course, with any illness, I would rather not have it than have it. I'm not particularly worried about dying if I get it. I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, obviously some people have died with it. There's the big yeah. difference in the debate. I, mean, my, I could say, too, my brother, my brother had it and was absolutely fine, thank God. Well, and, and I guess 99 percent of the people are. But yeah. uh, but there are some people with comorbidities, some people who are elderly, uh, some people who and again, there is a difference between dying with it and dying from it. Yes. Uh, there's also a big problem with false positives. And uh, again, we could get bogged down in this for, for an hour. I mean, God knows over the course of the last five months, we've spent countless hours talking about this. And, uh, but you know, what to, what's the, what's the, what's the reason, you know, for, for the government taking these actions and instilling all of this fear into people um, for something that just relatively isn't a, much of a scary boogeyman as far as I'm concerned. I've downplayed this from the beginning. I know some people on our side disagree, and you know, obviously people across the board have different opinions on it. Um, is it to get Trump out? I mean, that's hard to believe. I mean, he hasn't really done much to upset the apple cart in terms of you know the, the trends towards globalism and all the things we may be fighting against. Uh, Trump says a lot of things that our people like, but he hasn't really gone out and done anything explicitly uh, for favor of the historic American majority. Um, maybe it's to get him out. I mean, maybe some of these people believe he's a much bigger threat to, to their designs than, than I think he is. Uh, maybe it has something to do with, with the vaccine. I mean, maybe it's a beta test to just see how compliant people will be uh, for 
what may be yeah, the next thing. Well, I mean, it could be all of that. It could be a combination of any of it. Mm -hmm. I, I, one thing I don't believe, I don't know. Uh, you know, and it's okay to say you don't know. I can get up here and tell right. you this, but it's okay if we don't know why they they have taken this to the extent that they are. But the one thing that I do not believe at all is that the government. I mean, you see the scientific community, the medical community, is as completely corrupt. Yes. As any other institution, they are as completely corrupt yeah. as the churches, as government, as academia, as you know, you yeah. name it. And 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 they lost. Compromised credibility they may have had by saying, you know, obviously we got to close the churches because if you go to church, you're in danger of, of, of spreading this. You'll be a super spreader and Trump events are a super spreader, but it can't spread at a riot, at a riot where people are on top of each other, engaging in arson and, and looting and whatever else. It, it doesn't spread there. I mean, you had countless doctors and scientists sign off on this saying, no, no evidence that it, it, it spread at any of these riots. So, you know, forget it's all riot, that. It's riot resistant. It's riot, riot resistant, didn't you hear? They, they did a study on that. Yeah. Well, yeah. As, hold on, though. As long as it is an anti white activity out in the streets, if it's destruction of Western civilization, yeah. it magically so, can't spread. But if it's patriots, then it's being spread everywhere, as we saw with uh, what was that governor of uh, Wisconsin? What was her name? She said that they were they were spreading it by they got out into the streets. Remember the patriotic people? And she said, oh, they're just they're, they don't have masks on. They are going to be responsible for murdering people by being out here and spreading COVID. And then a week later, she was out arm in arm with people in a protest. Well, we saw, more. we saw it in London, too. In London, they were engaging in some of the same uh, monkey shines as they have over here, tearing down monuments and breaking windows of storefronts and, and everything else. And the, the, the British press said, no evidence that it could have, have spread at this, no way. And then a handful of, of uh, Bretons who, who love their, their country came out to sort of stand vigil uh, at the monuments, uh, the ones that hadn't yet <laughs> hauled off or taken down. And, and I think some of them were even arrested. Uh, and, and they certainly got very negative press for not uh, adhering to social distancing guidelines. I mean, this was within days of one another. Uh, and it just goes to show that, they, I mean, the media, it, it just doesn't even attempt to avoid hypocrisy and double standards now. I mean, they just absolutely flaunt it just to, I guess, see what they can get away with now because they know if anybody stands up and speaks out and and contrary to the narrative on social media, well, they can get that person fired. They can certainly get them deplatformed. They can you know, get their Twitter or Facebook accounts uh, obliterated. And so there's just no resistance because they've, they've ensured that no resistance can manifest itself because of the draconian punishments. But just to, to put a cap uh, on this part of the discussion, I don't know what uh, they're, they're up to with, with COVID. Uh, but the one thing I know for sure is it's not what they say it is. And that goes back to what I was saying in, in discrediting or how the doctors and the scientists have discredited themselves. I don't believe that they're doing all of this because they care about us. And they love us so much. And they just want to help us. And they just want to keep us safe. I mean, obviously. The, the, pe <laughs> the people who wear the masks, it, it, there you get this social delineation where the people who wear the masks are signaling that they do believe. They watch late night shows. They listen. They imbibe mainstream media. They think they're being a good citizen, and they look at you dubiously if you if you're not wearing a mask. Do you have anything by you like this? Where I have this weird thing where I am, where a lot of the people I talk to just out and about. I mentioned on a tap earlier this summer. I had funny conversations even with clerks and stores where. It seemed like most people, no matter what their persuasion, said what you just said, that there's more to this than meets the eye and, and we can't really believe what's going on. But then I do have to amend that and say more and more recently, I don't know why over the last few weeks, I'm seeing more people in cars, alone in their own car with a mask on, which blows my mind. Or I live near a lot of beautiful parks and open spaces. I'll take walks sometimes. Wide trails, more than six feet apart. We're outdoors. People see me approaching, I'm walking one way, another party's walking the other way, we're going to pass each other. They start, they put their masks on. I'm outside in a park, I don't even have the mask on me. My mask is in the car. You, you see that kind of thing where there's this kind of this split, and also how people are even alone in their cars. Do you see people <laughs> driving alone in their cars wearing masks? 
I, I again, I, I very rarely wear a mask. Only when I have to to engage in a in a particular transaction that it must be done. There's no way to avoid it. Yeah. And, and and my family is the same way. My my parents would be high risk at this at their age and and with some of their ailments and, and and they don't wear it unless they have to to get into a doctor that they have to see. I haven't actually seen an instance myself where the, someone's been combative. I mean, we've certainly seen it online and in different videos and I've never walked past somebody without a mask and they frantically try to grab theirs and put it on. I haven't seen that, but I have seen it many, many times, even going back to the very early days in this. And I certainly see it now on a, a weekly basis anyway, where people will be, as you said, uh, a, a single driver of a car, all the windows up with their mask on. I, I guess it shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, the, the, major, the majority of the public will obviously buy anything that the authorities tell them. Uh, the media, the government, they will fall in line. I mean, and you've seen this throughout history. Uh, you can apply this to, to so many different movements and instances and circumstances. Most people, and I say this all the time, and this is another reason why I generally don't get too despondent over our current lot in life uh, as truth tellers, is you go back countless examples throughout history, the vast majority, 90% plus, are going to do whatever the authorities in the media tell them to do. Uh, they're going to conform to that. And uh, to me, it is good to have truth on your side. I think that gives us a leg up that, that certainly our enemies haven't had in this country going back, you know, the last four or five decades. Uh, and they were able to overcome not having even a shred of truth uh, to, to their arguments and get people to believe in all sorts of incredibly um, lunatic ideas like equality of outcomes and, and, and all of these other things that they, that they pushed. But uh, really, it just comes down to power. Um, it's, it's good to have uh, outlets and platforms that we can we can reach people and and, and do our best to, to educate and inform and encourage and inspire them and I think that that's obviously you know I've, that's been my whole life that's what I've done my whole life and I, I don't think I've done it in vain but I, I also am not of the illusion that we uh, are going to be able to reach more people than they are able to reach I mean you, you're not going to outreach ABC NBC CBS I mean yes a lot of these networks are, are failing and dying, but they, you know, they obviously are reaching more people than, than we're reaching and that's okay. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a head count. We're going to win this person over to our idea. Well, they're going to win this person over, uh, and probably many more uh, than we are. What it comes down to is power and power shifts and power and, and, you know, people who have their hands on the levers of power, um, circumstances change. We don't know what the catalyst will be. It's, it's been different catalysts throughout history that, that, that have shifted the levers of power. And uh, I, I am just confident that one day something will happen, maybe something we can't foresee, maybe at a time that we don't foresee it, something will happen and things will change. I hope it doesn't have to be as a father. I hope it doesn't have to be something uh, maybe we were all more cavalier when we were younger. We wanted to go out and bonk some heads and just really get aggressive and go out into the streets and do a lot of stuff. And there is a time for street activism, you know, and, and, and you know, not the kind of street activism necessarily that we're seeing, but, you know, legal, legal stuff. Uh, but as a father now, I, I, I don't subscribe to the accelerationist theory because I don't want my children to suffer. I want to suffer that burden for them. I want to carry that cross for them and I want to make it better before they have to inherit this world. Uh, that, that, that will leave them. And obviously right now the trends are, are very bad, but, but I'm, I don't want it to be a situation where everything has to fall apart and balkanize and there be widespread violence before our, our people can, uh, can regain these institutions and, and, and correct uh, the monumental wrongs that have been inflicted upon us and uh, into this country, into the world, really going back to well, a long time, but obviously, you know, since the 50s and 60s, 60s especially, you know, you've seen a precipitous decline. But I do think the power will shift. And when the power shifts, this is the point. This is my long, uh, elaborative point. When power shifts, all these people who have bought into COVID, all these people who will tell you the sky's red, they'll be touting our, our talking points, and they'll be doing it again with that same sincerity uh, that we see them um, doing with, with, with all of the stuff we're talking about. Well, that sounds like a good segue into getting into, uh, 
even trickier territory, like we were saying, which is the riots and all the civil unrest going on. Obviously, this COVID, the election, they all kind of mesh together. So if you feel like making a point that connects to COVID again, please feel free to do so. But I know people are curious to hear about your take on what's going on and, and kind of, as we were saying in the beginning, how to assess it realistically and learn what we can from it, but also not let it just totally black pill you. I mean, unfortunately, I go through my Twitter and, and I understand what people are feeling right now. And I understand people are getting hurt, people are dying, and we need to spread a lot of these stories going on. But unfortunately, my Twitter feed is just, it's all, it's very dark. It's all just death and destruction. Um, so we, we're always curious to hear your take on this because you always have a good balance between being realistic, but also not getting black pilled. Well, you know, we probably talked about this on one of the previous appearances. Uh, I had the opportunity some years ago to, to appear on CNN and debate an NAACP spokesman about the murder of Channing Christian and Christopher Newsom, the Knoxville horror, that, that young college mm -hmm. couple who were just so brutalized and tortured. Um, and I guess that was probably the single I mean, it wasn't difficult from a personal perspective, but it was probably the most heinous, single most heinous. I mean, it's always difficult when you're talking about things like that. But I mean, obviously, I can't relate as, you know, as I didn't know those people. I mean, it was horrible and I can say it was horrible as anybody could. But it was probably the single most heinous story uh, I ever offered commentary on up until just a couple of weeks ago where you had the situation in North Carolina with the, the five year old boy Cannon. Um, but you know, obviously, not a tear shed for him, not a not a not a riot, not anything. Uh, this this whole thing, I mean, what we're seeing out there is is state sanction. Yes, the state could obviously stop this uh, if if they wanted to, and and it, it goes back again to the timing of it all. Is this all to upend Trump? I mean, the timing suggests that it may be. You you went from the Russia hoax to the the farce of an impeachment straight into COVID, straight into these riots. Mm -hmm. And the media fueled all of these riots. Uh, because what happened in both instances, the two biggest instances this year, obviously George Floyd and now uh, Jacob Blake yeah. up in uh, Kenosha. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say this, guys, if if the races have been reversed, I mean, first of all, there is nothing, not at all, to suggest that race had anything to do with either of the instances in Minneapolis or, or Kenosha. And in the, the situation in Kenosha, I mean, again, you're dealing with a guy with a long rap sheet that included uh, sexual assault of a minor, I mean, child molestation. He's resisting arrest. Didn't respond to a taser. Uh, yeah, they had a, you know, one thing you didn't see in the in the, the viral video is that uh, you know, they, 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 uh, uh, there was an altercation even before the officers had, had drawn their gun. And then he he walks over to a car. I mean, to me, it's amazing how people can see the same video and come or, or at least pretend to come to such wildly different conclusions. I mean, if I see a guy that I've just wrestled with and he's disobeying direct orders while a gun's pointed to his head and he goes into his car and he, he reaches in, I mean, what do you think? He could at least, there's at least a chance that he's reaching for a gun. And so they, they shot him or he got shot by the by the, by the one officer. Uh, if it had been a black officer in, in, a, in a white um, thug, uh, you know, I can say I understand it. I don't say I understand it because uh, of the, the, the races of the of the players here. I understand it just from seeing it and just being an honest guy. Situation with George Floyd, obviously all the drugs in his system and resisting arrest and having a long rap sheet as well. If you don't <laughs> engage in activities that warrant a call to the police and you don't go out of your way to antagonize the police and disobey direct orders, you're probably going to survive most encounters. But obviously these guys didn't. And I'm not saying the police are always on our side. In fact, overall, I think the police are just another arm of, of these institutions that, uh, in many cases, uh, are, don't have our best interests at heart. And I'm not saying that about the beat cop in your neighborhood, but law enforcement in general, when you're talking about the alphabet soup organizations, I mean, these aren't our friends. So I'm not saying cops are infallible. 
Uh, but to, to take these instances and, and ask the question, how in the world do these instances lead to uh, the, the, the rioting? And how has this rioting been allowed to go on unabated for months on end now? It just, it's, it beats anything I've ever seen. I mean, well, 20 the power, years the power apparatus is giving two sets of signals, two separate sets of signals for different people in this country. And, and therefore, we can get more into the deeper question of the, the breakdown of not being able to trust the order of a society anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, maybe again, maybe it, it is to get Trump out. Maybe the, the people who are really in control, and make no mistake, Trump is only the president. <laughs> you know, he's not, he's not in control, but he is the president. And maybe they want him out. I mean, it, it, again, the, the convergence of COVID and, and the, that whole narrative and, and the, 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 the breakout of these riots that for months and months and months have only gotten worse and more contentious. And now you've got all... Oh my God, how sickening is it to see what's going on in professional sports and just all of this. I mean, America is just, uh, you know, yes. just so tense and about to pop. And, and, and maybe they're thinking, you know, that'll, that'll do it. Of course, Trump hasn't helped himself. Uh, I've said this, you know, going back four years, if you don't get a handle on um, immigration, which is, of course, a straight ticket Democratic voting drive, then it's going to be an early night because if Trump loses Florida, you can go ahead and go to bed at eight o'clock Eastern because that election's over and he could very easily lose Florida, even without all of this. But but with the demographic reality on top of everything we see going on, uh, hard to see him winning, except for the fact that the Democrats nominated uh, probably the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, uh, it, probably the weakest nominee in the history of American politics, maybe. I mean, especially now with, you know, and I, I, I had some great grandparents that drifted into senility and, and so I'm not you know, making light of that, but I mean, obviously there's something going on there with, mm -hmm. with the cognitive abilities and then Kamala Harris, I mean. Well, is, is Kamala really the, the candidate? Yeah, probably. I mean, I think Biden will certainly step down very quickly uh, sometime during his first term, if, if if they happen to win, but that's really the only thing that's kept Trump in play is the weakness of the Democratic ticket and just how uh, how alien uh, they are uh, to. I don't think it does anything to really inspire the left to inspire the left wing of the Democratic base, which it was that right wing inspiration that really helped Trump in in 2016 and and the help that he got from. Uh, you know, that's where all of his energy came from. Really, was was people on the right. And I'm not talking about far right and radical people. I'm talking about what they call the right. And, and that's pretty much any any normal thinking, right thinking American. But anyway, with the riots, this has to come back to Trump too. I mean, again, I say he's only the president, but even the president has a little bit of power. And why has he not stepped in? I mean, I know he sends in the National Guard and they kind of sit there and, and maintain a watch, but they don't really do anything. The situation in Seattle and Portland, I mean, you're talking about rampant lawlessness. Forget about looting and burning down. Then you're talking about murders and all kinds of things. And, and sacking police stations and seeing the cops run away because they can't engage. I mean, what country is this? I mean, what, what level of a nation is this? I, I said before, you can't have a first world nation with a third world population. But mm -hmm. it's just anarchy in the streets. And Trump has done nothing to stop it. I mean, maybe they were bluffing in the 60s. But I, I, I said somebody needs to tell... Trump, that there's a school that needs to be integrated in these cities, and maybe the National Guard can get serious. I mean, maybe they really weren't going to open fire at Ole Miss, but, you know, we stood down anyway. Uh, but now, yeah. the bluff has been called, and, I mean, yeah. what do you have to do? We've seen murder. We've seen shootings. We've seen looting, arson, uh, the, the, the sacking of full city blocks of downtown, yeah. major downtown areas. I mean, what law has to be broken before there'll be any type of enforcement on this rabble. Because I tell you, if our people went out there, and we've seen it, uh, I say our people, people who aren't with them, let me put it that way, I saw people get arrested, uh, handcuffs on, on their arms for writing in chalk, unborn Black Lives Matter, it was some sort of a pro-life protest, and they actually got hauled away in a paddy wagon <laughs> for, for writing in chalk. Mm -hmm. That's not the, the you know, Hardcore felonies we're seeing on a daily basis. So why hasn't Trump stopped it? I think if Trump stops it, helps him win re-election. But there's a reason he hasn't, and I'd like to know what that is. 
Have you seen an uptick, whether in your personal life or the kind of phone calls and support you get for the political cesspool of more average people, of vagues who are being woken up by all of this? Uh, we, you know, we've always tried to, to reach out to regular working class, middle class people. So that's always kind of been our bread and butter. Uh, I, I would say it's definitely been an uptick, probably not to the extent that I would have anticipated when you're looking at this, how widespread all of this is. And I think a big reason for that is people are, I've never doubted that most white people fundamentally agree with us on, on the issues, but you have to earn their trust first. And I think people are just deathly afraid in the, to the extent that the cancel culture has has just really spiraled out of control. I think a lot of people probably are. If they don't know you personally, they don't trust you. They'll listen. Um, and they'll they'll cheer in the in the privacy of their homes. But uh, yes, the answer to your question is absolutely yes. But I, I think, given the circumstances, it should have been a lot more. Uh, but I think people are again. They don't want to be put on a list. They don't want to have their email address out there. There's a and, and listen. We're out there. We're public. We use our our real names, but uh, I, I can understand too, in a risk versus reward assessment, you know, you can very, very really uh, be blasted off of social media platforms, which isn't that big of a price to pay. But I mean, obviously people are losing their jobs, they're losing their livelihoods. I call it financial terrorism. If you speak out, e even, uh, I mean, obviously now it's gotten to the point where even Donald Trump is a Nazi and they call him all of these things that they've always um called us but uh yeah i mean if i'm if i am a father and i'm not engaged usually i'm not involved in, in, in um in our circle of friends where you know that there's a support group you know you think twice about joining up and putting your name out there even if it's writing a, a confidential letter because you just don't know i mean obviously yeah. you have to sleep let me we've, ask you. That. we've already got we've always gone to very safe uh, very extreme uh circumstances and, and measures to safeguard the anonymity of our supporters but uh i don't think it's a doubt that most white people agree with us but again getting them uh coalesce and getting them to stand together to where you could have a movement um uh out in the streets or somewhere else that that's difficult that's a difficult proposition because again there's there's two set of uh laws being enacted you go out there you burn down a city on behalf of a, of a left-wing cause uh you're going to get uh, public support the nba is going to raise uh, co corporate america is going to raise hundreds of millions of dollars for you you go out and you try to speak out in, in, in the in the public playing field for i don't know let's just say the defense of uh, a robert e lee statue where you get charlottesville yeah you know, it's, it's 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 difficult to get people to stand up and speak out and come together. They have absolutely made it in this country where you, where white people do not have the freedom of speech, association, uh, the the freedom to have a public assembly or any of that, and 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 whites know it and they've learned it well in the last two or three years. What do you think of the RNC strategy? And again, both of us here, I think it's safe to say we, Jason and I, try to take a nuanced approach and uh, not see things monolithically, not to say that they're by any means our saviors, but we do need to understand what is expedient for us and what's strategic and what buys us time and that, that kind of thing. But having said that, knowing that they're not our, our saviors and we're not sycophantic towards them, um, do you think there is this subtle messaging going on when you look at the RNC and they're bringing people up like the McCloskeys, people like that to speak? It's a very different uh, approach and strategy than the DNC's convention. Uh, where they maybe are trying to bring up people like the McCloskeys, give them a, a microphone to further that this message of what you're saying. Of the, there's the wide scale level of, yeah, you support the narrative, you support the mainstream, you can burn down a city and you're okay. That has uh, like a microcosm element as well. As you were saying, people feel this in their personal lives. They know that they they can't say the wrong thing or they're going to be ostracized, possibly lose their jobs and all that. Do you think that there's a, a subtle strategy and they're kind of playing a long game to make, without saying it overtly, just kind of make the average person out there connect those dots more and more and 
play on fear because we know fear is one of the primary motivators, uh, but in a way that at least corrals things a little more in our direction, play on that fear of people who are saying, look, if something doesn't change, there's two sets of laws. There's two sets of, of social codes for two different types of people and two different ways of viewing the world. Uh, Jared, that, that's, that's a loaded question, and there's so many different avenues to explore while answering it. Um, liking it to, uh, liking it to someone who's, who's on their deathbed. I mean, you want every last breath, right? You want to buy time. I think the difference, uh, the choice to be made between the Democrats and the Republicans are, do you want to hit the wall going 100 miles an hour? Or do you want to hit the wall going 50 miles an hour? And I think that's really the choice. But that's not to say that it's wrong to choose the 50 mile an hour option because it does buy you a little more time before you hit the wall. And the more time you have, the more chance you have for something to change. Now, uh, that being the case, I voted for Donald Trump, obviously, in 2016. Um, I, over the last four years, have gone back and forth and back and forth again on what I will do on Election Day of, of 2020. And I still don't know. If I had to tell you honestly, I would probably vote for Trump again. I know that's going to rile a lot of people out there, but it would rile a lot of them out there if I, if I said I was going to set it out. I typically have always voted third parties. Uh, I did that at least prior to Trump. Um, but I, I would probably do that again. If I vote, I may set it out. Uh, are, is the GOP just using whites as grist for the mill? I mean, there's no doubt about it. They're harving and, uh, harvesting us for votes. Yes, I did like, uh, by, you know, you mentioned it, the Bukowski's. I like that. That was a good move. And that's something I like. I love God knows I love when I see Trump mention the Confederacy in, in positive terms, you know, as a Southerner and as a, as, a, as a man whose ancestors fought for the South. I mean, that's still something near and dear to my heart. And so, you know, to praise Robert E. Lee, I mean, Trump definitely says things that if this current trajectory continues to, to go forward, you'll never hear. Forget ever hearing another president say, you'll never hear another elected representative say, uh, you know, uh, uh, on any level, maybe. Uh, even on local levels in the South. So, yes, Trump says some things that I like and that I, I that I certainly agree with. We haven't seen the the effects, uh, the positive effects in policy. And obviously this RNC convention, again, uh, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, uh, mm -hmm. some of these people, I mean, these, these are not our friends. These people aren't going to do anything for us. We have heard the Republicans uh, this week, as we always hear them, uh, tell us and and know in certain terms what they're going to do for every group of people on the planet, except for the people who actually vote Republican. I haven't ever heard Trump explicitly say, this is what I'm going to do to help white people. Now, again, dog whistling, if you squint and look at it, you know, with the right lens, or if you really, you know, turn up your hearing aid, you might be able to hear through the lines what they're going to do for you or how they would be better than Biden and Harris, you know, to be sure. Uh, but, but, but again, they're not stating it uh, explicitly. And, and why not? Why not? Because whites can't come together and create mm -hmm. uh, lobbying groups or pressure groups that, uh, that can stand up for our unique group interests like every other group has, of course. If we try to do that, we get on the hate list, we get defunded, we get deplatformed. But we're why privileged. But we're, but we're privileged. Yeah, yeah we're, we're privileged. Uh, Emperor's new clothes, man. It's Emperor's new clothes. Yeah, all of that, all of that's true. And so, you know, if you can't come together and apply pressure, well, pushovers are going to get rolled. You don't exist. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to, to sit in your tower and snipe off the few of us who are out there doing it against uh, against all odds. I, I think certainly if we had a lobbying group that could make them pay, uh, they, they would they would come back around. Why? Because a lot of these people, these people who are elected are no different than people in the general public. Most of them don't have core beliefs, inflexible beliefs from which they will never deviate like we do. Uh, they're just going to go with whatever is the past of, 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 of um, uh, least um, opposition. They're going to the, the, the path that's the most expedient for them in their careers or sociopaths. That's what they're going to do. But no, I haven't been impressed with the with the Republican convention overall. Uh, they should have had. Cannon Heinen's family uh, up there instead of pardoning you know, the bank robber. I mean, there's just so much they, oh, right. they could have done. That that whole naturalization ceremony that Trump presided oh, over yeah. night oh, before yeah. last. I mean, what a joke that was. And um, so again, 
you could, I could probably, if my assignment as a high school debate uh, student was give an hour on why our people should reelect the president, or if it was assigned to me, give me an hour on why our people should not reelect the president. I could probably make a convincing argument on either of those two questions, equally convincing maybe. Just a hard situation. And again, it shouldn't be that hard. We should be able to say, well, this is why Trump deserves to be reelected. This is what he's done. There's no doubt about it. Instead, it's back to lesser of two evils. Obviously, our people have conditions for our people have become less favorable across the board by every standard of measurement in 2020 than they were at this point in 2016. Everything's gotten worse. Um, it'll probably continue to get worse, but it may not get as worse as quickly as it would under Biden. And that's really, I guess, all I can say. I like a lot of the Trump stuff Trump says, but um, it's it's just not a clear cut choice. And that, that's a shame. As we get a little bit closer to the end here, uh, before we look at the super chats and things from the community here, uh, we can take a little bit of a longer view. I mean, on the one hand, we're, it's, we're so focused on what's going on right now in 2020. Uh, it might be throwing too much into the mix, but I, sometimes I have to think that what the long game that the enemy is playing, where even if Trump's reelected, and even if you can make an argument that, yeah, we know he, Trump's in the pockets of people who are our enemies and that it, like we said, it's a mixed bag. It's not uh, so cut and dry. At least it's not the Biden plan and all of that. But what happens in 2024? What happens, like you said, with demographics, whether it's Florida, Texas, both uh, things continue to go in that direction. And then I know a lot of people kind of give this analysis where, especially if it's after eight years of Trump, the line of reasoning will be, we have to de-Trumpify everything. We have to undo everything that he did and that when they eventually do get back in power it's going to be just be pedal to the metal and then you think to yourself well what what does that look like i mean even if we're buying ourselves time what what is the trajectory for all of this but um and that's a little bit dark perhaps but i mentioned so speak to that if you will but please do kind of wrap it up in the fact that you are a father, you have a family, you have the wonderful news of being very close to having your third child now come into the world. Uh, so we would, of course, like to hear you talk a little bit about that. Uh, give us a little bit of sunshine from the family life, from a traditional uh, fatherhood role, and uh, how you kind of mix that into everything that you do and have that help keep you sane. Well, listen, I mean, the most important, uh, this is a cliche, I guess, but the most important work any of us will do is in uh, within the walls of our home. And uh, I mean, obviously, it's our duty to go out there and to, to have children. It's our God ordained uh, uh, duty and to raise them to be right thinking, responsible, good people. And that's the thing. I mean, I think we have the moral high ground. I think we are the good guys here. But actually, what you said about Trump is probably the most compelling case I could give people to uh, trying to get him reelected. And that is the fact that whatever is going to come after Trump will come. Uh, I think with Trump, we know what we're getting. I, I, I don't want to say just let uh, the, the fact that uh, we're comfortable or relatively comfortable with Trump be the... Uh, the reason for reelecting him. But I mean, honestly, you can get a Biden or a Harris stand in in 2024. I mean, give it four more years just to shake out because what's going to come after Trump is going to be unpleasant. It's unpleasant already. I think it'll be more unpleasant. And, and the demographic reality of what's happening in America uh, is coming. Uh, I was talking to Nick Griffin earlier this year, and he had a really good line on that because obviously in, in the UK, um, they're beyond even where we are in some regards, especially with uh, free speech concerns and things like that. And he said uh, the uh, ability for our people to vote ourselves out of what's coming has passed. It doesn't mean our people are finished, he continued but that that mechanism uh, has passed. And so uh, it's a sobering reality. And obviously he wasn't calling for an insurrection or, or, or violence in the streets or anything like that, but it is true 
Um, politics is the racial headcount or whatever has been said so many times before. All of that's true. Elections are a racial headcount. Um, Trump did not pump the brakes on immigration. And uh, we are going to have to, that's something we're going to have to deal with. I mean, maybe, maybe leaving America altogether. If there'd be a place that <laughs> would accept us, you know, maybe somewhere in Eastern Europe, maybe that's something people need to look into. Our people will survive. Our people will triumph. I believe that, guys. I really do. Uh, it just may not happen within our lifetime, and it may not happen. I don't think it will happen within the current system. Uh, but uh, until that harsh reality plays itself out, what's the harm in four more years of Trump? Mm -hmm. That's just the way I see it. I think we're going to be fine, but we're not going to be fine under this present system. And this system, like so many systems and so many governments and so many nations and empires and civilizations will pass. Our people will endure. Right. Uh, on that note, just tell us a little bit about what you're looking forward to. You have a beautiful picture of your family as uh, the top post on your Twitter, at least the last time I went. Uh, you have two children already, like I said, third on the way. Uh, just give, give us a little sunshine about that. Take us a little into, into the excitement of the Edwards household for a moment, to whatever extent is appropriate. No, I would love to. In, in fact, that's where I'm at right now, of course. <laughs> and, uh, no, my wife, I met my wife when she was 15 years old mm. at church. And uh, we have been married now since 2006. And we have a 10-year-old daughter, a 5-year-old son, and one on the way. And it's going to be another little girl. And she is going to be here in just a, a couple of more weeks. So she'll be here. Due date is mid-October, but my wife always goes a week or two early. So uh, that'll be coming up fast. And obviously, I'm very excited about that. Uh, I, I, oh, I, isn't that right around the anniversary of your show? Is yeah, right? it, my son was actually born a day after I founded the show. I mean, I founded the show in 2004, wow. October 26th of 04. He was born in, in, in uh 2014, but October 27th. So yeah, we uh, for whatever reason, all the kids seem to come around. That makes it easy to remember everything, I guess. But, <laughs> no, we're really excited, and we should be excited. Our people should be excited. Our people have a future. Our people need to be listen. But this is where it starts. Mm -hmm. Our people need to be raising strong families, and by strong families, I mean I don't mean people that are go out there and make a a fool of themselves, but I mean raise strong and good. Men and women, boys and girls, uh, we can do that. That's something that they have not taken our ability to do yet. And only we can sacrifice our dignity and self-worth. Only we, we choose whether or not to buy into their narrative and to raise our children to be ashamed of who they are and how God made them and to raise our children to despise their ancestors. I'm not going to raise my children to do that. I'm going to raise my children to the best of my ability to think just like I do. And then when they become adults, they'll have a decision to make if they want to carry on. And, and I hope that I've given them a foundation in their childhood and in their upbringing that will encourage them to, to do that and to be responsible adults. Um, but that's the charge of any responsible parent. We have to really be high investment parents and uh, love our children. And, and my family is my entire life. And there's nothing that means more than that. I'm happy that I have an extended family of listeners and friends like you guys uh, who, who uh, helps make better uh, what really could be a very dreary existence. I mean, if you focused on just the way things are now and the way things are going in America, I could see people just checking out, getting on drugs and playing video games all day and, and not doing the things that we were put on this earth to do. Uh, but again, I, I've said it once or twice before, think big picture. America doesn't have to endure for our people to endure. Our people are our nation, mm -hmm. much more than some corrupt government or some system of government that we're currently engaged in. Uh, all, those things will always come and go. Our people are eternal. Mm. Be a part of that. Be a part of, of, of uh, the next generation. It takes us uh, to bring forth the next generation. And so, uh, again, that is what I think is my uh, biggest contribution to this whole thing. And uh, again, encourage your flock. Uh, there, there's no reason, no reason to fall apart because today is dark. Tomorrow can be beautiful. That is uh, absolutely gloriously said. What a magnificent show we've had so far, folks. And we're getting ready to wrap it up, tap it out today. But we do, uh, we're do. we going to be taking your questions quickly in the final 15 or so minutes. This has been 
Uh, so I can't even begin to say James Edwards at his absolute best. It's like, <laughs> this is the this is the this is the voice, the soundtrack that I have inside of my head. It's just the James Edwards, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you, we we have uh, James, as you know, we have a, a a growing flock around planet Earth. I mean, I want everybody in in Sweden, our contacts in Sweden, Estonia, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, Germany. If you don't know who James Edwards is, and you don't know who the politicalcesspool.org is, you need to find out. There is no one, there is no one who has endured more uh, political and social pressure than this heroic champion right here who has a smile on his face. I mean, you could hear from the beginning of this conversation all the way uh, up to uh, the present and you'll be hearing it for all the rest of the years that he draws breath in and out of those magnificent lungs of his. <laughs> He's able to share with us uh, all of his wisdom that this guy is indeed a happy warrior. This is who we have to be. Uh, as a people, all, all of these other, all of these others who melt under the pressure. This guy has had the federal government. Uh, this guy has had uh, all the the largest media empires uh, after him. This guy and mentioning him. This guy has had the national level of his church persecuting him and his family. And here he is, a a happy hero, a successful hero, doing magnificent things for us, driving enthusiasm and breaths of life into the work that we're doing for white well-being. Uh, and uh, still at, at this stage, I mean, this is just like, talk about like the 100 meter dash of life and gaining speed all the way down every single 100 of those meters. That's what uh, James Edwards is doing. What a magnificent story. Everything you have said, uh, just it sounds like my, my, my own inner dialogue. I would I could just have you talk from now on for me and I wouldn't have to say a thing anymore. It's so, it's so uh, amazing. And please, everybody, I'm not kidding. I'm not just uh, saying these wonderful things because James is such a good friend of mine and I've known him for a long time, love his family, love his wife, love his children, love the one to come, but because this is a true, genuine hero in uh, the, the uh, body politic of those fighting for white well-being. And if this is the voice, if this is the face, if this is the family that we could present to the totality of our brothers and sisters, the millions out, the hundreds of millions around planet Earth of normal white folks with ordinary sensibilities, if they could see James, James in his family, yeah. every yeah. single one of them would come to what we are doing. Every single one. All of these other ideas that so many people are able to get easily intoxicated by this violent idea here or this revolutionary idea there, or this esoteric idea here or this disconnected idea there. All they have done is fail. We need happy families to be the heart, the heart and soul, the, the breathing organism that continues what we are doing here from this generation to the next generation and the next. And my God, what a, this is James, James Edwards is like the hood ornament just gleaming out front, you know, like the, like the uh, Rolls Royce of white well-being his james and his family you we should get a sculpture of james's face jason and, and put it on the, <laughs> the hood of your car that'd be something i would i would if i if i had the money to have something like that made i absolutely would this has been so stupendous brother hey jason if i could speak like you we would have already taken over the world you do it better than me and that's not yeah. bs hey, and let me it, i'll tell you we have been through a lot we have been through a lot in my career uh, we have seen a lot and had a lot of damage. We've taken a lot of damage, you know, but we keep on trucking. Uh, but you, you have done some things I have never done. You've created your own vocabulary. You've got your own dictionary. You, you've got a whole new lexicon that has been uh, uh, impressed upon people. And I hear, I hear uh, some. Uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Some uh, N W G isms all the time. Uh, <laughs> yes. People are emailing me. I was like, yeah, I'm, I don't even know who you are, but I know you picked that up from Jason because that's his, that's yeah. his stuff. No, listen, guys. It, Spreading. It, collectively, collectively, I mean, we, we are a community. We have to be a collective. It's not me. It's not you. It's not any one person. We have to coalesce as a group. And uh, I know not everybody listening, obviously, is, is, is Christian. I have drawn a lot of inspiration from my faith. I think without it, uh, my work doesn't, doesn't hold up. And we've, of course, taken a lot of abuse even from uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, which was the denomination I was raised in. And uh, it's, you know, anybody that could oppose us and attack us, I think we've been attacked by and, and opposed by. But it doesn't matter. 
if you have faith that you are doing something good and that you are doing something right. And if you believe right. you're right uh, and you're telling the truth in love and you're doing this for the benefit of, of all people, but, but especially the people you love the most, your own family, uh, then how can any, any sort of name calling or all the other things that they try to do to you, how can that get in your way? I think everybody has to be resolute in this. We have to understand that the stakes are high. Courage has never been in shorter supply. I see what y'all see. I look out there. I know what's going on in the world. I mean, I'm a happy warrior. Somebody mentioned the, the ostrich, you know, but we don't do that. I'm a happy warrior, but I'm not an idiot. I see what's going on. I have no illusions about what we're up against. The number of cowards and sellouts and traitors in our government and our schools and our media and our churches, it's astonishing. But this is what everybody listening to this show has to say and, and, and apply it to the extent that they can. Not everybody can do what, what y'all are doing. But everybody can do something, and if nothing else, they can set this example in their homes, which comes back to the point we are making just a moment ago. Say, I'll never bend the knee. I'll stand for you. I'll stand for my family. I'll honor our ancestors, and I'll fight for our future. Everybody can do those things no matter how it's done. No matter how they go about doing it, you can do it and, um, and set an unapologetic example of how our people can carry themselves with their shoulders squared and with a little bit of dignity and honor, uh, even in this world gone mad. Yeah. What I like about your approach, James, and, and Jason's lexicon, like you were saying, the psychology and the verbiage on that more nitty gritty level that he gets into, both to me, the heart of it, of both of these things, is that instead of sinking down to someone else's level and trying to wrestle with the different worldviews when someone is uh, being anti-white and trying to get you off of your balance is you just soar above it. And I think that, that there's a very different, it could be subtle at times, but there's a very different energy and posture, the way you walk through the world when you have that kind of thing, where you're not going to get down into the fray and, and take on these attacks against you and these anti-white word games manipulations. You're just going to soar above it. There, there's just this basic underlying assumption that you are who you are. Like you said, it's unapologetic. There's just, you, you know, it's not hateful. You don't even need to engage in that. You don't need to justify that. There are no justifications. That, whether it's a, in the most subtle way and just how you carry yourself, the nitty gritty kind of breakdowns of psychology and words that, that Jason's gotten into, almost like a scientist with that, no matter how big picture you go or, or how into the details you go, that basic posture, that basic attitude to carrying oneself, I think is one of the greatest examples that you both give and you allow other people to take that, take that on, ingest it into who they are. Because I could tell you, everybody listening, that posture more than anything else, but more than memorizing facts and statistics is going to attract other people to you like a magnet. It's going to prove itself self-evidently. Other average people who haven't had to confront this before are going to see that in you. They're going to see that it's not the kind of villain that the media portrays. Mm -hmm. And that kind of thing, embodying that, is what's going to help wake more people up and give them the courage to say, I can do this too. Jared, I appreciate what you, you said, what y'all both say. And remember, when it comes to what Jason says, he's not verbose, he's loquacious. <laughs> there's a lot to say, but there's never a wasted word. But no, no, seriously, this is, I, I believe it was Sam Dixon who, who first who I first heard this from. He's a an attorney and a longtime friend of mine. Um, some of your audience may know him. Yeah. But uh, he wrote, base your decision on any issue or any action by asking the question, is this good for our people? And, and what are we talking about when we say our people? Well, I, I consider that to be my family and, and our race is our extended family. Is it good for our people? Ask yourself that and then go about forming your position on any given issue as a result of the answer to that question or in whatever activism you may engage in as a result of that question. One thing I despise is attention-seeking behavior. Mm. Yes. I don't like it. We all do. <laughs> I have turned down countless interviews over the years because of the answer to that question. Is me appearing on this show going to help our people? Now, in some cases, the answer is yes. Uh, in a lot of cases, the answer is no. And if it's not, um, then, then, then don't do it. 
And again, tend to the flock. So again, whether it be your family or in our cases, our audiences, all I want to do is be a good shepherd. And I may lose everything. I mean, we could all lose everything. Who knows what's going to happen in America? I, I, again, this isn't a contradiction to the point I made earlier when I say that our people are eternal, our people are going to survive. Our people are going to turn this thing around. I may or may not live to see it. My children, grandchildren may, may, may not live to see it. Who knows what it's going to happen? But it will happen. Our people are too wonderful, too brilliant, uh, mm. too, too ingenious to go out like this, I think. So my job here is to be a good shepherd, tend to my flock to the best of my ability, not engage in attention seeking behavior, but but base everything I do uh, on, on, on based upon the answer to the question, is it good for our people? I may lose everything. They may throw me in jail for so-called bad thought or, or whatever. But the one thing I will never lose is my self-respect because I won't give it to them. That's the only thing that you can maintain that they can't absolutely take is your self-respect and your uh, being committed to these ideas that animate our action. Uh, only you can choose to disavow, to apologize, to, to give them that. Uh, I, that's one thing they'll never take. And as long as I have that, I'll be okay. Amen, brother. Let's jump to these uh, financial gifts and questions so we can uh, tap out today. We have the wonderful Lark Ascending, uh, wonderful dear lady, thank you for financially gifting 10 pounds from the UK. Thank you. So beautiful. And writing here, best 10 pounds I'll spend this week. It absolutely is. Thank you, Lark Ascending. Uh, we have a, a financial gift and a question from Kev, Tall Kevin we'll get to in just a moment. We have David uh, Marcus financially gifting 20 pounds. And thank you so very much for that, David. This is the perfect storm for waking up our people, he writes. Thank you for that. On the question widget, just real quickly, I'll run through. Yiz the eunuch is doing great work uh, in service to white well-being, writes, had an amazing two-hour stream on DLive last night. I got to speak white hot truth about going free. Please share uh, with the community. And I put that link in the live chat a little earlier. Bogus Warrior asking about uh, his account, Wild Fang. I'll, I'll look into that. He is also writing here, uh, Biden is the discarding Sabbath that will be discarded should he win the election, which will deploy the anti-white ordinance into the presidency. Well, yeah, and uh, as I swivel back around, I'll just say, and I'm just seeing on the screen right now, somebody with the name Jason saying, we will win. And that's an excellent name you have there, brother. Uh, I just, I just want to say that we. Uh, I also agree, uh, James. You were mentioning there about voting for Trump. We absolutely admonish everyone to vote for. Well, we say T Rex. We, we, we very much with the AI listening dislike Donald Trump. We very much dislike him. But we want everybody to vote for T Rex, <laughs> to vote for T Rex, or to vote for T Rump for what he will not do, which is the Biden plan and the Way Forward Act and the Heroes Act and uh, also a, a couple of treaties. In fact, one of them that will make it illegal to give personal, financial, private gifts to anyone who espouses anything that the anti-whites could consider heretical. So that would absolutely be the end of financial, financially supporting anyone saying anything that the anti-whites could consider heretical to anti-whiteism and therefore would be a quick and swift, a very swift end to the work that uh, we're all doing in service to white well-being. So we need another four years of uh, the T-Rex. We have the great D.B. Cooper over here, financially gifting $3. Thank you so much. A great participant. And with him, another magnificent participant in service to white well-being, the wonderful Slots doing amazing, amazing things, taking the lexicon and dialectics of going free into the arena on Twitter daily and numerous bouts with uh, folks teaching and bringing people over, financially gifting $10 and writing, James Edwards, let's go. Absolutely, lots of O's there as well. And we have uh, the question from Tall Kevin, and then we have two more questions that I found in the live chat. And that is $4 that he financially gifts. Thank you, dear brother. Great participant in our community. Writes here, was the, and we refer to it, brother, as the war for Southern independence, was the war for Southern independence escalated 
for financial reasons, since the North couldn't compete with the agricultural South, drawing parallels to our current situation where GDP is valued more than culture and people. And I'll toss that over to you, James. Oh, well, yeah, you know, that's a question for me. Well, of course, uh, that war, like every war that has ever been fought, was fought over land and money. I mean, that's, that's the reason any war was fought. That war was no different. And uh, I believe at the onset of the war, you'd never believe this. I believe Mississippi was the richest state in the country. That's the poorest. Mm -hmm. So we lost that war. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, yes, indeed. Regrettably, uh, it is uh, it is the case, though, but I concur. We have also, looks like, a question from Waylon asking, uh, could you ask James if he thinks the Sons of Confederate Veterans is a good organization to support, or are there better organizations similar to it that he should support? Um, Sons of Confederate Veterans is okay. There's certainly some very good people in it. Um, I, you could certainly do worse than uh, tracing your lineage and they, they have genealogists who help you with that. And uh, they do try to maintain monuments and engage in, in, in lawsuits to, to that effect. And I know some very good people in the SCV overall, um, you know, there's stronger organizations, I guess, but to, to maintain a yearly membership doesn't cost much. It's not throwing away money to sign up for thirty or fifty dollars or whatever the going rate is, and, and, and getting certified that you that you have that uh, that lineage. Not that you need it from an organization to make it valid, of course, but no, it's 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 good enough. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. I, I used to be a, a member of the SCV, and uh, there for for the all the exact same reasons, I would say support or or, or find uh, find something else that's actually a little bit more active for white well-being they are not openly white positive whatsoever and in fact right. they've, uh, they, they've made open uh, testaments uh, to the uh the multiracial uh, environment of the south and uh, the contributions of all of these other peoples and but never i don't think n noting that i recall the contribution of white people yeah right and, and what you said i mean what they attest to is apocryphal of course but it's just like everyone else and anything else. They do a little bit better than, than, than most, I guess. But uh, I, I'm trying not to be, I don't like to you know, speak poorly. Um, so I'm trying to temper all of this. But yeah, they, they get into all that because again, they're scared. Mm -hmm. They're fearful of, of being closed down and, and, and having, you know, being burned out and all of the other horrible things that might happen. Uh, if you if you tell the the complete truth about things and and again that's why we at least spiritually and mentally need to abjure the realm mm -hmm. and you just have to dispense with fear if you, if you just what's going to happen is what's going to happen you don't need to go out and look for trouble you don't need to go out there and, and try to get yourself uh, to to put yourself in a position where they make an example out of you right but at the same time. Don't go through life being fearful and don't adjust your message. I guarantee you the stuff you're hearing out of the Confederate veterans now, their own fathers and grandfathers weren't saying when they were leading the organization in the 50s and 60s. And so don't don't let fear cause you to trim your sails and sell yourself short. Right. Well, very well said. And I, I get another important point is that James Edwards is not running the Sons of Confederate Veterans. So it's not gonna be as masculine and, her and heroic. I think we're gonna end up saying one of these days, uh, Forrest and Edwards, that will be the, the saying uh, as we move forward into history. One final financial gift here is uh, from Squirrels, five Canadian dollars. Jason, I finally bought Going Free. I'm excited to read it and then share it uh, with my base boomer bosses. Well, that sounds great. I assure you that they'll even find value in it and their minds will be changed. Now, what I'd like to do, uh, James, is have you give your final thoughts, let people know where they can find you, what uh, you uh, might be working on next, maybe some future guests. And before you do that, to, to segue right into that, I would just like to ask my own question on if you have any thoughts on this uh, Kyle uh, Rittenhouse and uh, this, this individual who's now being charged with first degree murder, uh, having gone out with a, a, a rifle and a medical kit, 
uh, to tend to the, uh, I guess, to protect, he claimed, to protect a, uh, what was it, an auto park, and then also to give medical attention to anybody who ends up being uh, uh, jumped and attacked by the mob. Uh, and then your, your thoughts on him, and then, as I said, what you're doing and where folks can find you, brother. Uh, thank you, Jason, for all of that. I'll try to remember it. <laughs> my brain doesn't work as good. My, my processing unit you know, doesn't work as uh, efficiently as yours. But the, the thing with Rittenhouse, obviously tragic. I, I think we've been saying this from the beginning. Do not engage in these state-sanctioned riots. Uh, even if you claim to be going down there to keep peace or to, to protect property or whatever he was supposedly down there for, you put yourself in that situation the people that are down there are allowed to break any law they want. Yeah. But if you are under the illusion that we live in a lawless society entirely, you break a law and you'll see just how quickly the law can be enforced. It is being mm -hmm. significantly enforced. He made a big mistake going down and involving himself in that in any way. I mean, people would say, well, what? You're just going to allow him to, to, uh, take over our cities and burn down. We got to go meet them. We got to go fight them. No, you don't. Uh, this is, there is a time and a place for all things. Again, go back to the question, is it good for our people? Is it good for our people? How many people are you going to get to go downtown with you? Do any of these cities? One, I mean, he's the only person I've known that has even done it yet. Don't do it. Stay away from these things. Yeah. Stay away from, from this anarchy. Uh, if ever you were to do something that could violate, uh, that could be interpreted as even violate. Look at the McCloskey's, for God's sake. I yeah. mean, that's not a lesson. They stand out on their own property and uh, let it be known that they are armed to keep uh, these these uh, lawbreakers off of their property and they're the ones <laughs> that are getting felony arrest warrants served. Uh, that tells you all you need to know. And, and, and they didn't even pull the trigger, thank God. I'm yeah. sad that this happened. I hate to see loss of life in any capacity. Um, God only knows what's going to happen to this kid. I mean, I know the Republicans, there's some Republicans standing up and speaking out for him. Um, I guess, you know, you want justice to be served, but we have no idea what his thoughts are on any of the issues, or at least if, if there is any knowledge of that, I don't, I haven't seen it yet. I mean, maybe he'll learn something. I don't know. I don't know what he believes politically or, uh, or anything like that. But uh, I guess the lesson to be learned from that uh, ordeal is uh, for the, the sake of your family, don't go down and, and, and get involved in any of this stuff that's going on. I mean, that is, is something for law enforcement to deal with. They come into your house, that's a different story. But yeah. uh, it's, uh, you know, he could very well go away forever. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh, I, I tell you this, if they find out that he ever once went to a website that they hate, uh, he will go away forever. And that'll be yeah. the difference. Now, uh, as far as me, you know, we're always up to something. We always try to have a good time. We try to tell the truth in love, but not get mired down and bogged down in the uh, the dreariness of it all. We, we have some special series throughout the year. Every April, uh, we do a Confederate History Month series uh, to get us back in touch with our Southern roots. Uh, in, in March of this year, we did a what we called a March Around the World, where each guest during the month of March was a representative from a different European nation to kind of give us the lowdown on on what, um, what was going on uh, in their nation at that time. We had some elected officials and spokesmen and different things. And uh, you know, we never try to do a throwaway show. Uh, 16 years, you know, every now and then you think, well, maybe you just come in and mail it in. You've done so many hours mm -hmm. of, 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 of this. But no, we try to make every show the very best it can be. Uh, obviously, we tackle the issues that uh, people who tune in uh, to, to this uh, broadcast uh, would uh, be interested in and uh, we do it with our own unique flair and that's one thing that's that, that's so great about our collective is that people do approach it from slightly different perspectives but we're all still pulling in the same direction so obviously for me for our show it's a synthesis of uh, realities uh, about um, racial dynamics that's something we talk about of course but we come at it from a uh, a Southern perspective and a Christian perspective, because that's who we are. We don't play characters. That's how we were. That's the kind of people, uh, that's the life we led before getting into this. So that's, uh, we, we try to be very real and open with our audience and, and share information about who we are as individuals and how that informs and applies to our activism. So you can't separate who we are as, as, as people or as men 
from from our work. So we come at it from that perspective. Obviously, other people, other people who are doing great work, come at it from a different perspective. But uh, there are obviously a lot of parallels and overlaps. And together, we uh, we are doing everything we can uh, to stoke the embers and to uh, keep uh, keep the pot light on, <laughs> to give a little bit of light in this world of darkness. And hopefully, one day that'll that'll spread to become a uh, uh, a very big brush fire indeed, and, and will will awaken our people again. I would like to say, speaking of our people, one person in particular that I have to mention, we'll just mention his first name, Chris down in Florida. You know who I'm talking about, Jason. Yes. Really a friend of mine who has become a great uh, friend of yours as well, and I know he never misses one of your shows, and uh, he loves the work y'all are doing. Sharp guy, smart yeah. guy, talented guy, as so many of, of our listeners are. And uh, I want to be sure to say hello to him. Very well said, brother. And thank you so much. I don't think I've had a time when I've had a, a guest on that I agreed with every single thing that the guest said in full. It's just, this is, I think, the first time ever. But Mr. George, uh, what are your final thoughts and where can folks find you? <laughs> Well, it's always great speaking to you, James, and thank you and your family for the time you able to share with us today again. Uh, so we have uh, veterans with us in the audience. We always have new people in the community as well. So Jason and I always like to give a warm welcome to new people, even if you're not participating in the chat or checking us out afterwards. Uh, we try to really, as I said earlier in the show, make things uh, as available and out there for you as they can be and to stand the test of time. So um, almost a year ago, a couple months, Jason, we, we have another anniversary to celebrate and we do share the month of October with James and the very busy Edwards family of all these important days in October. We're a couple months away from the first anniversary of the afterparty.tv. And that's our joint venture where all of these are cataloged and a lot of other media that we do and a lot of community generated media that just happened spontaneously, so much so, in fact, uh, that Jason started this great venture, the uh, Chuck Martell Garage Party, if you don't mind me saying that, Jason, on your behalf, mm. on uh, Friday nights, a uh, music and arts listening party. And uh, there's going to be a new newsletter. We send out a newsletter every couple of months just kind of as a digest. We don't spam you. But please go sign up to our newsletter on our site, theafterparty.tv. It's a good way just to keep informed and kind of digest some recent goings on both with the show and just the general spheres. And uh, if we were ever off social media, that's an, a good way for us to be in contact. We have a lot more control over our site. Uh, of course, we both have our own site. So mine is thegreatorder.com. And like James was saying, you know, this is a rich environment and we all have to uh, be who we are and kind of speak to the different interests that we have. It's great being involved with guys like this. There's all these different prongs of projects that we do. I like a lot of culture. I like a lot of the idea that even though they, these are challenging times, we're still living our lives day to day. And there need to be things to give us nourishment and sustenance for that mentally, physically, and spiritually. Uh, so I'm very into culture. Um, I write, I have uh, creative projects coming up, more creative projects coming down the pike. I've seen a little preview of Tony Vermont from the White People's Quarterly Magazine, brilliant beautiful literary magazine. Uh, I'll have a new poem in there soon. We have a book project coming out that Jason is involved in as well that uh, is, is just a work of art that Tony's made and we can't wait to share with the world. Uh, I have a new show with John Bruce Leonard, an American who's living in Europe, of course, the editor of Arctos called Learning in Public. And we kind of use that to just uh, air out and hash things out more conversationally on the fly and take on some different topics on that live stream. The next one, we just started that about a week ago, week and a half ago. So it's a brand new venture, but please do check it out. We're going to be live on my channel next at 2 p.m. Eastern this Saturday, two days from now. Uh, that is eight o'clock in Central Europe. And I, uh, I think that is it for now, Jason. I don't know if I missed anything, but uh, there's always a lot going on. So please, again, try to spread it out by especially bookmarking our websites, get on that newsletter, follow us on all the different social media platforms. So you kind of hedge your bets as we all do this together. We all learn together, inspire each other, get us through these challenging times. But as I said, we're still living our lives day to day. We have to be able to find the beauty and the joy in that. You got to keep that front and center as James was speaking to so beautifully. But with that, Jason, I give it to you to take us out for today. 
Well, thank you so much, good brother. I want to give a enormous thank you to my brother down south of me and a fellow Southerner, Mr. James Edwards. And it will be in the future, absolutely, Forrest and Edwards. What an amazing uh, man this is. What an amazing family. A big debt of gratitude also to his heroic and stunning wife, who has also weathered the storm of criticism from federal government and national church level idiots uh, and uh, media empires far better than uh, the vast majority of even men out in the rest of the white positive sphere who have melted down around just what what a what a just this is a storybook family so so thank you so much for being with us a big thank you to my great colleague brilliant colleague mr george and all of the work that he does uh, to make all of these shows and in all everything that we bring to you it's edifying interesting entertaining as they can possibly be so thank you my dear brother and let's shine a spotlight on some of the folks that i saw in the live chat today i saw somebody by the name of so what welcome to you haven't seen you before i saw somebody by the name of glenn a big salute and spotlight to you lord groiper hello to you spotlight on you as well as anthony great to see you with us we also have a uh, financial gift late financial gift from art acrobats and what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, since we're tapping out right now, these questions I'm going to put in a direct message message to James Edwards. And then if he would like, he will answer them on his show. So that's how you all are going to go find these questions, the answers to these questions. And uh, Art Acrobats, thank you so much. A great participant in the community. $5 financial gift. Who wants to make? White positive movies is the question. And uh, I'll make sure that that gets in a direct message to Mr. Edwards. We also have Mick Dozer financially gifting $5 over here on Entropy and writing about Kyle saying that uh, he pulled off three shots from a downed position and uh, neutralized uh, three uh, victimizers. And then he walked away. He, uh, Mick Dozer says he did better as a child, as a kid than most trained adults i guess in, in protecting himself certainly and uh thank you for that fine uh, five dollar financial gift and one more that will be put into a direct message to james and that is from the great tall kevin three dollar financial gift thank you so much brother and it is his question and this is really going to keep people wondering until uh, james's show this weekend and that is james edwards favorite southern food excluding fried chicken and we'll find out on Saturday, folks. So make sure that you show up on Mr. Edwards' show and he will be answering those two questions at least. I'll get him both in the DM. And uh, you'll be able to find him at thepoliticalcesspool.org. And remember, they're uh, Central Time. So when we are going here by Eastern Time. Make sure that you are looking on his website, finding his show live and there on time and catch him in the great work that uh, he does over there with Keith. And we will look forward to seeing you all again here on TAP next time.